Hi everyone, it's Paul from One Cast One Fish and welcome to the ultimate guide to the Garmin Striker Fish Finder. This video is a culmination of the 11 in-depth classes on the Garmin Striker Fish Finder that we've previously covered condensed into one video. To provide you with a one-stop shop, tutorial, and instruction manual to help you better learn and use your Garmin Striker Fish Finder. Today we'll be discussing the device interface keys and their functions. I'm going to introduce you to the home screen, discuss the zooming and panning features on the waypoint map, we're going to look at GPS signal strength, and I'm going to show you how to find your GPS accuracy. Now if you're new to this channel, be sure to hit that subscribe button and do not forget to turn on your bell notifications because I promise you, you are not going to want to miss any videos in this series. Let's start out by discussing the function of each of the keys located on the device. The back or return button will return to the previous screen or if held returns to the home screen. The arrow keypad allows you to scroll, highlight options, and move the cursor. The arrow keypad also is used to zoom in and out of a view and pan within a view. The menu button opens menu options for a given screen if applicable. Pressing the menu button again will close an open menu. The power button, when held, will turn off the device. However, if you quickly press the power button once, you'll be taken to a menu that will allow you to adjust the backlight, day or night color mode, and give you the option to disable or enable the sonar. The select button is designated by a check mark. You'll use this to acknowledge messages and select options. The waypoint button gives you a quick and easy way to save your current location as a waypoint. It's extremely important that you feel 100% comfortable with all of the keys and their functions located on the device interface, as we'll be using them to navigate screens and menus throughout the videos in this series. The home screen is the main menu for the Garmin Striker Fish Finder. This is where you'll be selecting the features of the Fish Finder that you want to use such as the traditional sonar, flasher, and GPS waypoint maps. Now one thing about the home screen I do want to point out is if you scroll all the way to the bottom you'll see an option to customize home. We'll be going over in depth how to customize the home screen of your Garmin Striker Fish Finder in a later video. Now as a tip and a reminder as I mentioned earlier if you hold the back return button regardless of the screen you may be on you'll automatically be taken directly back to this home screen. Now let's take a few moments to discuss the zoom and pan features of the waypoint maps, along with an example of how to apply them. If you look in the upper area of your screen, you'll see the options for zoom and pan, along with corresponding up and down and left and right arrows. These arrows represent the inputs from the arrow keypad that you'll use for the desired function. The zoom and pan features can be used by themselves but really shine when you learn to use them together. We'll start with the zoom function. In the lower right hand corner you'll notice that we're currently zoomed out pretty far at 30 miles. Though 30 miles is a long distance it gives you a good view of many of our waypoints that are spread out across this body of water. Now by pressing the up arrow on the arrow keypad we'll zoom in on the current location which will use the boat as the center point. You'll now notice that our distance line is now indicating 12 miles and we lost some of those far off waypoints from the map. This also made some of our closer waypoints more spread out and viewable. Pressing the down arrow on the arrow keypad will notice that the screen zooms back out. The key takeaway when using the zoom feature is that you can zoom in or out as far as you'd like to view more or less waypoints and that the zoom feature uses the boat as your center point on the screen. The pan feature can be activated using the left and right arrows on the arrow keypad. When you press the left or right arrow we notice that a movable cursor appears. You'll use the arrow keypad to move the cursor around on your screen. The key takeaway here is that when in pan mode the screen will use the cursor as the center point. Now I'm going to show you how the zoom and pan work together. Let's start by moving our cursor over to brush pile 2. And once our cursor is over Brush Pile 2, you'll see a notification. Now let's zoom in for a closer look at the Brush Pile 2 waypoint. 
you'll see that in order to zoom after using the pan feature, we'll need to press the back return button first. This will take us out of the pan mode and once again we have the option to zoom in or out. We will now press the up arrow on the arrow keypad and zoom in to brush pile 2 waypoint. Learning how to use the zoom and pan features on the waypoint map is going to be an essential skill to learn, especially as we move forward in this series with more advanced features of the Garmin Striker Fish Finder. Now let's talk about GPS signal strength and GPS accuracy. When you turn your fish finder on, it will begin connecting to and collecting satellite data on your current location. You can see your current signal strength at the top of the home screen. You can also take a more in-depth look at your GPS signals from the home screen. Scroll down to and select Settings, System, GPS, and select Sky View. This will show you the current satellites and their signal strength that your fish finder is using. Another cool feature that can be seen on the Sky View screen is your GPS location accuracy. In class number two, we're going to be covering device configuration settings. Specifically, we're going to be going over system settings, my vessel settings, alarm settings, unit settings, and navigation settings. First, we'll look at the Garmin Striker system settings. Starting from the home screen, let's scroll down and select settings. Here, we'll have the ability to adjust settings within the system, vessel specs, alarms, units, and navigation menus. Let's start by selecting system and going through the system settings menu. But before we get started, I want to point out the upper portion of the screen. You'll notice that the name of the parent menu is listed. This is extremely useful in helping you navigate through and understand where in various menus and sub-menus you are. Under the systems menu, you'll see settings that are adjustable for display, beeper, GPS, auto power, language, system information, and simulator. We'll start with the display settings. You will see the option for adjusting your fish finder backlighting, which can be adjusted to make your screen brighter or darker based on ambient lighting conditions to help make your fish finder screen easier to see. I also have a video dedicated to adjusting the screen backlighting, which I'll provide a link to in the video description. You can also change the screen color mode between daylight and night, and that also helps make the screen easier to see based on time of day. Or you can leave the color mode in auto and your fish finder will automatically switch between daylight and night mode based on the current time. The daylight mode displays the screen with brighter white backgrounds to help make the screen easier to see and read during bright daylight conditions, while the night mode displays the screen with darker black and blue backgrounds to help make the screen easier to see and read during dark night conditions. Beeper settings are pretty simple. This is where you can decide whether you want your unit to beep. You can choose between having your unit make a beep notification whenever you select an item or an alarm is triggered, or you can have the unit beep only when an alarm is triggered, or turn off all beeps for a silent operation. I personally feel that setting the beeper to alarm only is the best setting since it alerts you to important information without being excessive by beeping every time you press a key or make a selection. Turning the auto power to on will turn on the device automatically whenever power is applied. I personally don't use this feature and keep it off since I like to have control of when the unit powers on and powers off. Our next setting is language. Here you can set the preferred language for the text on your Garmin Fish Finder. Scrolling down and selecting system information, we'll see that we have a new set of menus for the event log, Garmin device, software information, and factory settings. The event log will show you a list of system events such as alarms and notifications. This can be extremely useful when troubleshooting issues or looking back into past historical events such as traveling to a waypoint or arriving at a waypoint destination. Under Garmin devices you'll see the device type, which in our case is a Garmin Striker 4, your current software version, and the unit ID. Software information will show you relevant information with regard to your specific Striker unit software and version history. Scrolling to and selecting factory settings will allow you to return your Garmin Striker Fish Finder back to factory default settings. You can learn more about setting your Garmin Striker Fish Finder back to factory default settings with a more in-depth video that I'll also leave a link to in the description. A word of caution though, restoring your Fish Finder to factory settings will erase 
all of your current saved data and waypoints. Next, under the system menu is Simulator. This is one of my favorite options for learning your fish finder. No one likes to make a lot of adjustments and learning how to operate their fish finder while on the water, taking up precious fishing time. That's where the simulator comes into play. When selected to on, a continuous simulation of sonar return and images will play on the sonar screen within your sonar view. This is a great environment to learn how to navigate menus and try different color palettes and options within the settings to really dial in what suits your need. The best part is, all you need is a power source for your fish finder and you can learn and adjust all of your settings from the comfort of your own home. The simulation mode also gives options through the setup feature to determine pertinent information like vessel speed for use in GPS simulations such as setting tracks and waypoints which we'll be covering in a later class. I'll also be covering more in depth on the simulator mode in later classes. Now we're going to move along to adjustable vessel settings. Moving on to my vessel under the settings menu we see two options, one for keel offset and one for temperature offset. The keel offset offsets the surface reading from the transducer for the depth of a keel, making it possible to measure the depth from the bottom of the keel instead of from the transducer's mounting location. This can be especially useful for boats with keels and to offset the water depth for a boat that has a deep draft. The temperature offset allows you to use a known good water temperature reading, usually obtained with a calibrated temperature probe or meter, and adjust the Garmin Striker water temperature output to match the known accurate water temperature to make up for any inaccuracies from the transducer's temperature recording. Using this technique, you can get pinpoint water temp accuracies out of the Garmin Striker fish finder. Now we're going to look at alarm settings. Next, under the settings menu, let's select alarms. This is where we can set our various alarms and notifications for the Garmin Striker units. We can customize our alarms and notifications for navigation, system, which is kind of like a general alarm, and sonar. We'll start by selecting navigation, where we'll see options to set alarms and notifications for arrival and navigation to points, along with anchor drag and an off course alarm. First, we'll start with how to set our arrival alarms. We can determine the type, activation, or what causes the alarm, and the parameter for each alarm. Under alarm type, we can select off, which would be no alarms, destination, only alarms when you arrive at a waypoint, or destination and turns, which will give you an alarm notification for each turn of your track and upon arrival. Once we determine the type of alarms we want, we'll select activation. Here we'll choose to be notified either by distance or time. If you select distance, you'll have the option to input a distance parameter that you would like to be notified prior to your arrival or turn. When setting your alarm parameter to time, you can then set a desired amount of time prior to your arrival or turn that you'd like to be notified. The anchor drag alarm is a drift alarm. You want to turn this feature on whenever you're anchored and want to know if your anchor is holding you in place or if you want to be notified if you've drifted off away from your current location. When turned on, you'll be able to enter a distance parameter. If your vessel moves from that position by the inputted distance, you'll receive an alarm to let you know that your anchor is not holding you in place or you've drifted from your current location set point. The off course alarm, when turned on, will notify you that you have veered off of the set track or course heading. When you turn the off course alarm on, you can enter a distance parameter. This is where you'll be setting how far off course you want to allow your vessel to veer before receiving an alarm notification. Moving right along to our system alarms, we have the options to set alarms for alarm clock, device voltage, and GPS accuracy. The alarm clock is literally an alarm clock. You can set the desired time, just like an alarm, and your fish finder will act as an alarm clock and notify you at that time. The device voltage is an important alarm, and I recommend turning it on. You definitely want to know if your battery voltage has dropped to an unsafe level. Using this chart, we can see that in general, a lead acid battery will be fully charged above 12.7 volts, and it's pretty much dead below 11.3 volts. I personally have my alarm set for 12 volts on all my fish finders. Though this will sometimes give false alarms when cranking a big motor over, it'll easily clear after the motor is started. 
However, if my battery voltage drops below 12 volts and it's not under a heavy load like starting a motor, I want to know that I may have an issue or that my batteries have drained to a point where I need to return and recharge them. Under GPS accuracy, you have the option to set an alarm for the GPS accuracy. When you turn your GPS accuracy alarm to on, you can select the GPS accuracy limit and if your GPS accuracy falls below that limit, you will receive an alarm. So if you set your GPS accuracy alarm for 25 feet, any time the GPS accuracy is not within 25 feet, your fish finder will give you an alarm. Our final alarm menu will be our sonar alarms. This is where we'll be able to set alarms for shallow water, deep water, water temperature, and fish alarms. These alarms are going to be a personal preference for each angler, vessel, and the conditions that you fish. The shallow water alarm can be set to on and you'll be given the option to set a desired alarm depth. If the depth goes below that set point, then your alarm will sound. The deep water alarm can be set to on and you'll be given the option to set the desired alarm depth. If the water depth exceeds your set point, then an alarm will sound. The water temperature alarm, if set to on, will give you the option to set a desired alarm temperature. If the water temperature goes above or below that set point by two degrees, then an alarm will sound. The fish alarm can be set to sound an alarm whenever a fish may be present. I say maybe because even though the Garmin Striker does a rather good job of identifying fish, it still will make mistakes and give false alarms or miss actual fish sometimes. That's why it's always best to learn to read and interpret your sonar returns as this will be the most accurate way of identifying fish and structures. Now for me, I have all these alarms turned off. And because I'm using my kayak and I fish a lot of shallow water, the shallow water alarm is just going to be a nuisance for me. I'm also not worried about the deep water or water temperature alarms because I can see all that information in real time on my sonar screen. Now I just want to say these are my settings based on my own personal experience and how I use my vessel and fish finder. Now, based on your experience and what you use your fish finder for or your vessel, your needs may be totally different than what I use mine for. So in that case, be sure to use whatever works best for you. Now we'll take a look at adjustable unit settings. The next settings we'll look at under the settings menu are the unit settings. Within the unit settings, there's many that you can and should adjust to your preference. However, there are some that we should just leave alone unless we have a specific reason to adjust them, as improper adjustment or changes can result in inaccuracies while navigating with the GPS. First, we'll look at the system units. This is where you can adjust the way the unit displays, units of measure. You can change between statute, metric, nautical, or you can even customize the units to your liking. I also have a more in-depth video on changing your units of measure that I'll link to in the description below. Under variance settings, you can set the magnetic declination, which is the angle between magnetic north and true north for your present location. My recommendation is to leave this in auto unless you have a very firm understanding of mapping. Next, you can set your preference for north reference between true, grid, or magnetic north. This sets the direction references used in calculating heading information. Setting to true north sets the geographical north as the north reference. Setting to grid sets grid north as the north reference, or 000 degrees. Magnetic north sets the magnetic north as the north reference point. I find that leaving the setting to magnetic north has served me just fine for my needs, and I recommend that you do the same unless you have a very good understanding of mapping. The position format setting will allow you to change the way headings and position information is displayed on the fish finder. Do not change this setting unless you are using a map or chart that specifies a different position format. The map datum sets the coordinate system on which the map is structured. Again, this is a setting that you do not want to change unless using a map or chart that specifically specifies a different map datum. Under time format, you can decide if you want your time displayed as a 24 hour or 12 hour clock format. For example, two in the afternoon can display it as 2 p.m. or 1400. Adjusting the time zone will allow you to adjust the unit for a specific time zone you'll be operating in. The daylight savings selection can be set to auto to allow the unit to adjust for daylight savings time automatically. Next up will be our navigational settings. Next under settings we'll look at navigation. 
where we have the options for setting our route labels, turn transition activation, turn transition time or distance based on your activation selection, and route starting point. We'll start by selecting route labels. This is where you can determine how you would like your routes to appear, either by name or number. I personally prefer naming all my routes and waypoints so they're easier to identify later. Next we'll set the turn transition by time or distance. Under turn transition activation you can choose whether to use distance or time to begin transitioning to turns on your routes. When distance is selected for turn transition activation you'll be able to set how far before the turn that you transition to it as the next leg. If you set your turn transition activation to time you'll be able to set how many minutes or seconds before the turn that you transition to it as the next leg of your route. Now to help make this a bit more understandable we'll look at an example of a route with turn transition activated. As we start our route and approach the first turn on the route we'll get a notification since we have our arrival turn alarm activated from earlier in this video. Now as we start to transition to the next leg of our route you'll see that we have a yellow line and arrow. This is your turn transition. And moving further along here on another leg of the route, you can see that instead of an abrupt turn, we have a nice slow transition into the turn along our route, indicated by the yellow arrow and line. The next setting you can adjust is how you would like to start your routes. You can choose either to start your routes from where the boat's current position is, or you can start a route from a specified waypoint. In today's class, we're going to be covering how to add and delete items from the home screen, adding a data graph, adding a number screen, adding the flasher, and my favorite, how to make customizable combo screen. Now we're going to look at how to add the data graph screen to your home screen. Starting on the home screen, we're going to scroll down and select Customize Home. Here's where you'll see that we have the option to rearrange our home screen or add to it. We're going to start out by selecting Add. Now you can see there's options available to be added to the home screen. We can create a new layout, which we'll go over a little bit later, add a data graph, add a number screen, or add the flasher. Let's start by scrolling down and selecting Data Graph. Now as you can see, the data graph will be shown on the home screen. And notice the arrows on the left hand side. It's at this point that you'll have the option to scroll up or down using the arrow keypad to place the new data graph where you'd like it on the home screen. Once you move the new data graph feature to your preferred location on the home screen, simply press enter and it'll add the data graph to the home screen. So what exactly is the data graph feature? Let's take a look. Select data graphs and you'll see a graph on your screen. We can customize this screen to our liking by pressing the menu key. This will bring up all of our menu options for the data graphs feature. You'll see we have options for changing the graphs and setting. Let's select change graphs. This is where you can select what parameter you wish to see on the graph, either water depth, water temperature, or both. Let's select both. As you can see, we now have graphs for both our water depth and a graph for our water temperature. Now we're going to look at graph setting options. So press the menu key and select depth graph setting. Here you're able to set your X and Y axis for your graph. In this case, the duration and scale. Selecting duration will let you set the duration axis on the graph, while selecting scale will let you adjust the scale axis. I recommend keeping the scale and auto. Now let's move to the temperature graph settings. And again, you'll be able to adjust the graph duration and scale. Selecting duration will let you set the graph duration, and selecting the scale will let you adjust the graph scale, which again, I recommend leaving in auto. A quick tip if you use the graphs feature, I recommend keeping your settings the same for both the temperature and depth graphs. For example, if you set the duration for one hour, you should set both the depth and temperature graph duration for one hour. Same for the scale, which again I recommend leaving in auto. Now we're going to be looking at how to add the numbers feature to the home screen. The numbers screen is a pretty useful feature to add. It displays a whole lot of information in an easy to read and quick to access format right from your home screen. And at the end of this segment, I'm going to walk you through how I have my personal home screen set up on my Garmin Striker Fish Finder. Starting on the home screen, select Customize Home. Scroll down to and select Add. Now scroll down and select Numbers. Now the Numbers feature will be shown on the home screen. Again, use the arrow keypad to move the Numbers feature to your preferred location on the home screen. And then press Enter to add the Numbers feature to your home screen. Now we'll take a look inside the Numbers feature. As you can see, the Numbers feature is exactly what the name implied. It's a screen full of useful information and numeric values, and it's highly customizable to match your needs. 
Pressing the menu key will see that we have menu options for our numbers screen. These include change numbers, change layout, reset trip, reset odometer, and reset max speed. The first thing we want to do is scroll down and select change layout. Now you'll see the option to select the number between 1 and 6. This is going to be how many number boxes you want available on your screen. If we select 4, we'll see that our number screen now only has 4 boxes with available information. Now let's go back and change our layout to 6, because I like to have more information available on the screen at one time. Now we have our layout selected, we'll press the menu key and select change numbers. This is where we'll begin customizing our number screen to suit our needs. I recommend spending some time going through all the options and features here to really find out what suits your needs best because there's a lot of custom options available as I'll show you. You can use the arrow keypad to scroll over any number box and press the menu key to change that parameter shown in that particular box. Let's select the first box and press the menu key. You'll see we have six main menus for options here. GPS, navigation, water, sailing, system, and trip. Now as a side note, these menu options are available for every box by simply scrolling over a box and pressing the menu key. Let's start by selecting GPS options, where we can select from GPS speed, GPS position, elevation, GPS heading, and GPS error for our displayed number options. Under the navigation menu, we have the option to display bearing, off course, waypoint velocity, odometer, arrival at destination, arrival at next, time to destination, time to your next turn, distance to your destination, distance to your next turn, and turns. Now if you've already watched class number two, a lot of these should sound somewhat familiar as many of them were discussed briefly in various navigational settings. Under the water menu, we can select and display depth or water temperature. Under the sailing menu, you can display the estimated sunrise or sunset times. Under the system menu, you can select to display the time of day, date, or device voltage. And under the trip menu, you have the option to display your max speed, moving average, moving time, stop time, total average, total time, and trip odometer. Now I'm going to show you how my number screen is set up. On my number screen, I have depth, water temperature, device voltage, GPS speed, trip odometer, and GPS position displayed. I feel that knowing the battery voltage at all times is very important. I also like the trip odometer displayed so I can see how far I've paddled while out on the water. I display the GPS position for safety reasons just in case of an emergency and I have to access my current GPS coordinates to get help. Now before we move on from the number screen, let me share a few more tips. First, you can reset the trip odometer by selecting reset trip. I do this before each outing so I know how far I travel. If you select reset odometer, it'll reset the overall odometer, which brings me to my next tip. Even though you may not have every parameter shown on your display screen at one time, the fish finder is still tracking them in the background, and they can be made available simply by changing your displayed number settings. To show this, let's look at this example. Even though I just reset my trip odometer, the fish finder is still tracking my overall travel distance with the odometer. I know the flasher is pretty popular. So next, I'm going to show you how to add the flasher to your home screen. Starting on the home screen, select Customize Home. Now scroll down and select Add. Now scroll down and select Flasher. Now the flasher will be shown on the home screen. Use the arrow keypad to move the flasher feature to your preferred location on the home screen and press Enter to add the flasher to the home screen. In some instances, you might find that you don't actually use all the screens on your home screen. In that case, you can delete the ones that you don't use. So now we're going to go into detail on how to delete items from your home screen. To delete a feature from the home screen, go to and select Customize Home. Now scroll down to and select Remove. Now you'll notice some features have an X and others have a lock icon. You can only delete features that have the X. Now since I don't use the Data Graph feature, I'm going to scroll down and select Data Graph. Once you select the feature to delete, you'll get a message to verify that you do indeed want to delete this feature. In our case, we're going to select Yes, and this will delete the feature from your home screen. Now as a tip, you can always add any feature you've deleted back to your home screen at a later time if you like. Now we're going to talk about one of my favorite features, the Garmin Striker Fish Finder. And that's the ability to add combo screens to the home screen. Combo screens allow us to look at two different features at one time, such as our sonar and waypoint maps on the same screen. Starting on the home screen, scroll down and select Customize Home. Now scroll down to and select Add. Now select Add New Layout. Here we're going to select our first function. We can choose between traditional sonar, flasher, split frequency, or waypoint map. For this example, we're going to select traditional sonar. And after we select our first function, we'll be prompted to select our second function, 
which on the striker series is going to be the waypoint maps. Now that we've selected our two functions for our combo screen, we're going to be able to adjust some of the settings and make a few changes if we want. Let's scroll down to and select overlay numbers. Here we have the option to turn on our overlay numbers and compass tape if we wish. Now I'm going to be 100% honest with you. You're going to be tempted to turn all these features on so you have a lot more information on your screen. But I have to remind you, we're already starting out with about a 4 inch screen on the Striker 4 and we're building a combo screen. So that 4 inch screen is already going to be cut in half. If we start adding a bunch of other information to the screen that we really don't need, in most cases our screen will get very cluttered and it's going to be harder to see and read. Since we're already cutting the screen in half, I never turn on these extra features. It's just a whole lot easier for me to go back to the main menu and select the numbers screen we talked about earlier to get the information I need. And in case you're wondering what the screen looks like with the overlay numbers and compass tape turned on, here you go. As you can see, the information provided is not really worth giving up the extra real estate on the screen that can be used for sonar waypoint maps. Now this is just my opinion and my preference so feel free to experiment with the features and see what your preference might be. Now let's get back to setting up our new combo screen. Here you'll see we have the option to choose how our screen will be divided, either horizontally or vertically. For this example we're going to select horizontal. Once we're done customizing our screens we'll select next and we'll be given the chance to name our new combo screen. I recommend naming your screens in a format that's easy to remember and identify for you. Next our combo screen is going to pop up and you'll see the arrow keypad in the middle of the screen. This is where you can move the center line to adjust either how big or small each of your two screens will be. We can make our sonar screen larger or smaller by using the up and down arrows on the arrow keypad. Now for this example we're going to split the screen at about the halfway point between the sonar and waypoint maps. And once you get your screen split dimensions that you're happy with, you press the enter button. Our combo screen now show up on the home screen and we'll use the arrow keypad to move it into our preferred position on the home screen. Once in position, press the enter key and our new combo screen will be added to the home screen. Now let's select our new combo screen from the home screen. Now press the menu button to bring up available menu options for our combo screen. First we're going to look at how to change the active function, which will allow you to change which screen is the active screen, either number one or number two. The screen you have highlighted will determine which screen you selected to be the active screen. In this case, number one is highlighted and our sonar screen is going to be our active screen. Next we have the traditional sonar menu. That gives you the option to make a wide variety of adjustments to your sonar screen. The adjustments available in the combo screen are the same as what they are in the traditional sonar screen. You have the ability to adjust things such as the range, gain, frequency, zoom, overlay numbers, and sonar setup. We're not going to be going into detail with each of these are since we'll be covering each component of the sonar menu in depth in a later class. Next we have the waypoint map and this will have all the available adjustments just like the dedicated waypoint maps feature. Here you can select and adjust the following features. Stop panning, stop navigation, restart go to, waypoints, routes, tracks, search, zoom, map setup, and overlay numbers. Again, we won't be going into each of these in detail because we'll be covering them in a later class. Now feel free to spend some time on your own searching through all these available options within the sonar menu and waypoint map menus. And remember, we'll be covering both in depth in later classes. Now let's scroll down to and select configure layout. Here we can change the name of our combo screen if we'd like by selecting split. We can change our screen between horizontal and vertical. Selecting change function allows us to change between different functions available on our combo screen. This is where we can change out our traditional sonar on our combo screen for other features if we wish, such as split frequency or the flasher. Looking at the option for overlay numbers, you again can add overlay numbers and a compass tape to your sonar screen. And again, like I said earlier, I normally leave these functions off to reduce clutter on the screens. But I'll take a few moments to show you what each feature is in case you want to enable them on your screens. Let's select overlay numbers to show by pressing enter. This gives us a whole group of new menu options to edit the layout, navigation, insert, navigation insert setup, and compass tape. By selecting edit layout we can edit the layout. Let's take a closer look at the screen that pops up. You'll see three boxes at the top of the screen. These three boxes are considered layout one. Now if you press the menu key to switch layouts, you'll see three additional boxes appear at the bottom of the screen. Now you have six available boxes for information and this is considered layout two. You can use the arrow keypad to highlight any of the six boxes and press enter to change the data points shown in each box. Now these options should be familiar since they're the same options that were shown on our number screen selections earlier in this class. Now let's look at our combo screen with the overlay numbers shown. As you can see our selected information from our overlay numbers is shown at the top and bottom of our screen. Now let's select our navigational insert to auto. 
Now if we look at our combo screen, we now have an additional piece of information in the form of a navigational bar. Now we're going to go one step further and also select the compass tape to on. And looking at our combo screen, we can now see the compass tape at the very top of the screen. Again, you can see why I keep the overlay numbers, navigation insert, and compass tape off on all my screens. They just take up too much screen real estate in my opinion. Now, if any of these features are something you like or would want to turn on on your screens, then by all means, don't hesitate to turn the features on. Because if you change your mind, you can always turn them off later. Now I'm going to tell you something that you won't hear very often from me. I'm going to tell you one of the things I actually dislike about the Garmin Striker Fish Finder. And it has to do with how you change features in the combo screens, traditional sonar, or waypoint maps. I'm not a fan that if you change settings on your sonar or waypoint maps, they transfer through to every screen on the unit. Meaning, if you change the color or displayed information on your traditional sonar screen, those changes carry through even to your combo screens and vice versa. So any changes I make to the sonar, regardless of the feature and function I'm using at the time, these changes are applied to every sonar screen throughout the unit. I hope someone at Garmin watches these videos because I would love to be able to set different sonar screen setups, for combo screens at least. It would be nice to be able to set up a screen with the fish icon, a separate combo screen that might be in black and white sonar, and another sonar screen maybe in standard colored sonar. But currently this isn't possible because any changes I make to the sonar screens or the waypoint maps carries through to all the screens throughout the unit. Now in this class we're actually going to be covering topics I get a lot of questions about. We're going to be looking at our sonar setup features like depth lines, noise rejection, and overlay numbers. We're also going to be looking at how and why we should change our screen scroll speed. We're even going to look at how to adjust the color scheme to different color palettes for your sonar. But that's not all. We're going to be going over sonar features that I guarantee are going to help you catch more fish and learn to interpret your sonar better. Like the edge feature, which is used to help determine between a soft or a hard bottom. The A-scope for real-time sonar data returns. And we're even going to look at how to add fish symbols to your sonar. From the home screen, scroll down to and select traditional sonar. This will bring us to the traditional sonar screen. Let's press the menu key. This will bring up our menu options for the traditional sonar screen. Here you'll have the ability to adjust and change setting for the range, gain, frequency, zoom, overlay numbers, and sonar setup. For the purpose of this class, we're going to be covering sonar setup and overlay numbers. However, I'll be showing you the other options in detail in a later video. Let's scroll down to and select sonar setup. Here we have the options to turn our depth line on or off, adjust our screen scroll speed, change our screen's appearance, adjust our noise rejection settings, and restore the sonar to factory default settings. We're going to look at how to add and adjust the depth line first. Let's scroll down to the depth line. Now use the enter key to turn the depth line to show. Now we can hit the back key until you return to the sonar screen. Now you can see our screen has a line with the depth. In our case, the line's at 17.8 feet. You can press up and down on the arrow keypad to move the depth line either up or down on your screen. This feature can be used when trying to determine the exact depth of a fish, bait, or structure, or when more precise depth information may be needed. Now we're going to discuss a very important feature that can have a huge impact on how fish arches are displayed on your screen, and that's the screen scroll speed. Now let's go back to the sonar setup screen and select scroll speed. You'll see we have five scroll speed options, ultra scroll, fast, medium, slow, and auto. The scroll speed sets the rate at which the sonar image moves across the screen. A good rule of thumb is to set the scroll speed to match your boat speed, and setting the scroll speed to auto will allow the unit to set the scroll speed based on your current vessel speed. Having the correct scroll speed selected ensures that targets are drawn with correct aspect ratios and aren't going to appear distorted on your screen. Scroll speed can have a huge impact on how targets are displayed on your sonar screen. A lot of times when I hear complaints about the fish finder not showing arches or that the fish arches are distorted, the problem can be traced back to an improperly set screen scroll speed. If your vessel is moving slowly or your scroll speed is set too high, your fish arches tend to be more elongated on your screen. If the vessel's moving faster, your scroll speed's set too low, the fish arches tend to be more compacted on your screen. Now if you want to learn more in depth about why fish show up as arches on your sonar screen, be sure to check out my video on fish arch interpretation down below in the description. Now we're going to take a look at another feature that can also have a huge impact on how images are displayed on your sonar screen. And that's our noise rejection filters and settings. From the sonar setup menu, scroll down and select noise reject. You have three adjustments for noise rejection, interference, surface noise, and TVG, or time varying gain. Now we're going to look at each of these in detail to help you get a clearer understanding and a clearer sonar image. From the noise reject menu, let's select interference. 
Changing the interference level adjusts the sensitivity in order to reduce the effects of interference from nearby sources of noise. When you adjust the interference setting from off through low, medium, and high, noise is gradually removed from the image. You should always use the lowest interference setting that achieves the desired improvement in your image quality. Some of the most common reasons for increased image noise on your sonar screen are poor sonar installation or other electronics or power sources located nearby. If you have noise and interference issues, you always want to try to eliminate the sources of the noise first. And that's because as you increase the interference removal, the return images can start to suffer. Let's go back to our noise reject menu and select surface noise. Here you have the option to show or hide surface noise. Surface noise is caused by the interference between the transducer and water. You can select hide for surface noise to help reduce this clutter. I personally prefer to keep my surface noise setting to show. And that's because with the surface noise hidden, the fish finder may also hide any fish that may be present near the surface. Plus, I feel the Garmin Striker has a better option for controlling surface noise without such a high risk of masking targets near the surface. And that's what we'll be covering next. Let's go back now and look at TVG, or Time Variable Gain. TVG reduces surface noise while also allowing stronger target returns to still be shown near the surface. This control is best used for situations where you want to control and suppress clutter or noise near the water surface without severe degradation of your near surface returns. TVG adjusts the appearance of returns to compensate for weakened sonar signals in deeper water and reduces the appearance of noise near the surface. When the value of the settings increase, the colors associated with low level noise and fish targets appear more consistent throughout various water depths. This setting also reduces noise near the water surface. Again, I'd start with the lowest setting and progressively work higher until the desired image improvements recognized. I prefer to adjust and control excessive surface clutter and noise with the TVG setting over the surface noise setting. And normally the low setting has been adequate for most of my fishing needs. However, you can always experiment with the setting for your fishing conditions and choose one that suits your needs best. Next, I'm going to show you how to restore your Garmin Striker Fish Finder back to factory default settings. Now let's go back to the sonar setup screen and select restore sonar defaults. Next you'll be prompted to select yes or no to ensure you want to restore your sonar to factory default settings. If you do intend to restore your fish finder to factory default settings, simply select yes. Now as a side note, if you restore your fish finder to factory default settings, it's going to erase all your saved data within the fish finder. Now we're going to check out something that I know is of interest to a lot of viewers. We're going to talk about how to change the sonar appearance. This is going to include different color palettes, the edge feature, a scope, and how to add fish symbols to your sonar. We're going to start out at the traditional sonar screen and press the menu key. Now scroll down and select sonar setup. Scroll down to and select appearance. And here we have menu options to adjust our color scheme, edge, a scope, or add fish symbols. Let's start out by selecting color scheme. This will bring up a full list of color schemes available on the Garmin Striker Fish Finder. Blue, yellow, classic blue, classic white, maroon, red and green, orange, red, green, and gray. Now as you can see, we have a lot of options and to save you a whole lot of time selecting through and looking at each one, I'm gonna show you what each one looks like real quick right here. Now when choosing a color scheme, choose one that works best for your eyes and allows you to easily differentiate between sonar targets. Some of my favorite color schemes are classic blue, classic white, red, green, and gray. I also prefer the lighter backgrounds for bright or sunny days and a darker background for low light conditions. Now you might be wondering why gray is on my list of favorites. The one main reason I really like the gray color scheme is that it does a great job of separating out returns and allows you to see a whole lot more intricate detail within your image. This can be extremely useful once you learn to read and interpret sonar better. You may actually find that the gray color scheme becomes one of your favorites too. This next feature we're going to talk about is guaranteed to help a lot of beginners better interpret the bottom composition on their Garmin Striker Fish Finder. I get a lot of questions about how to interpret a hard bottom from a soft bottom on our sonar returns. Well, the edge feature is going to help with that. From the sonar appearance screen, scroll down to edge and turn it on. Now use the back key to return to the traditional sonar view. Here you'll see a black line at the bottom of the sonar screen. That black line is the fish finder and all of its infinite skill and wisdom interpreting what it believes to be the bottom and the bottom composition. Now this is the part that's really cool about the edge feature. Based on the bottom composition, either hard or soft, the thickness of that line is going to vary. For hard bottoms, the line is going to be thicker and for softer bottoms, the line is going to be thinner. This can be extremely 
useful if you haven't yet learned to interpret bottom composition on your fish finder. Now this feature is not 100% perfect all the time and should never replace learning how to interpret your sonar for yourself. But I can tell you it's a great tool to start with and learn from until you're more comfortable interpreting what you see on your sonar screen. The next feature we're going to look at is one I believe should always be turned on. And once you learn to use it better, I guarantee it's going to open up a whole new perspective to what you see going on below your vessel. Now we're going to look at the A-scope feature. Let's start from the traditional sonar and press the menu key. Scroll down and select sonar setup. Now scroll down and select sonar appearance. Scroll down and ensure A-scope is turned on. Now press the back key until you return to the traditional sonar screen. Now on the right hand of the screen you're going to see the A-scope. The A-scope shows real-time data from within your sonar's transducer cone. The one thing we have to understand about our sonar screen is that all the data we see on the left hand side of the screen is old data. That means the only real time information we have is located right here in the A scope. So once you see that fish arch on the left side of the screen, that fish is actually already outside your transducer's cone. Which means that fish is no longer in the general area directly underneath your boat. Now one cool feature that Garmin did add to the Stryker series fish finder is located on the bottom of the A scope, you'll see a number. This number represents your current transducer cone diameter. Now I could spend over 30 minutes explaining sonar cones and fish arches. But again, I'm just going to recommend you check out the videos linked down below in the description as they'll go into detail about why fish show up as arches on your sonar and a few videos explaining sonar frequency and cone angles. If you really want to learn more about your Garmin Striker Fish Finder, I highly recommend these videos. This next feature is great for beginners learning to interpret images on their sonar. And that's the fish symbol feature. From the traditional sonar screen, press the menu key. Scroll down and select sonar setup. Now scroll down and select sonar appearance. Scroll down to and select fish symbols. And here you'll see you have five options for adding fish symbols. You can turn them off, have the fish symbol along with background sonar data present, have the fish symbol with background sonar data present, along with the estimated depth of the fish. The next fish symbol option shows just fish icons and no background sonar data. And our last fish symbol option again shows only the fish icon and no background sonar data, but it does add the estimated depth of the fish. Now I want to be 100% honest, the fish finder does a pretty good job of interpreting fish with the fish icon symbols, but it's never going to be 100% accurate. Now we're going to look at our numbers overlay selections for our sonar screen. The sonar overlay numbers are located in the upper left hand corner of your screen and can each be turned on or off through the menu settings. From the traditional sonar screen, press the menu key. Scroll down to and select overlay numbers. This brings up our menu for adding or removing number overlays from your sonar screen. We can add the navigation insert, compass tape, and decide if we want to hide or show our device voltage, depth, speed, or time of day. Now, as I've said in the past, you're welcome to turn on the navigation insert and compass tape, especially if you like them and find them useful. But again, in my opinion, they take up just a little too much real estate on my screen, and I prefer to keep them off. Now, as far as the other options, I recommend leaving them all on, as they show very useful information, and they're tucked over in the top left-hand corner of the screen, up out of the way. Plus, if you remember from earlier, that section of the screen is old data anyway. In today's class, we're going to be looking at how to adjust our range, zoom, gain, and we're going to look at our sonar frequency selections. I'm also going to be showing you a trick on how to pause your sonar. Now, throughout this video, I'm going to be referencing other videos I've done in the past that are full of great supplemental information. From the home screen, scroll down and select traditional sonar. This will bring us to the traditional sonar screen. Now, let's press the menu key. This will bring up the menu options for the traditional sonar screen. Here you have the ability to adjust and change settings for your range, gain, frequency, zoom, overlay numbers, and sonar setup. Now for this class, we'll be covering range, gain, frequency, and zoom as we looked at sonar setup and overlay numbers in class number four. The first feature we're gonna discuss is range. From the traditional sonar menu, scroll down and select range. Here you can adjust the range of the depth scale that appears on the right side of your screen. You can either set your depth range manually or allow the fish finder to automatically adjust the range by selecting auto range. I rarely ever adjust my depth range manually because in my opinion it's just way too much work to consistently adjust the depth range as the bottom contours change consistently. And without proper adjustment, it can lead to issues like this with your sonar image. In my opinion, the Garmin Striker does a pretty good job of adjusting the depth range when in auto. And automatic ranging keeps the bottom within the lower third of the sonar screen, which means you can spend more time fishing and less time messing with your fish finder. The next feature I'm going to talk about is the zoom feature. From the traditional sonar screen, press the menu key to bring up the menu options for the traditional sonar. Now scroll down and select zoom. Here you'll see you have a few options for zooming in on your sonar screen. No zoom, bottom lock, manual, auto, and split zoom. Let's start by scrolling down and selecting bottom lock. 
Bottom lock's gonna lock the screen to the bottom based on your depth selection. However, it's only gonna show that depth range. And again, in my opinion, without consistent adjustment, this zoom option can be prone to display issues on your sonar screen. Back at our zoom menu, scroll down and select manual. With the manual zoom selection, you have the options to adjust the zoom and depth. Now, as we adjust our zoom, you'll notice the box on the right hand of the screen changes size to represent the area of your zoom. And adjusting your depth will move your zoom box within the water column. Back at our zoom menu, Let's scroll down and select auto. Now with auto zoom, again, you have the ability to change your zoom window size, but the biggest issue with the auto zoom is that it uses the bottom as the starting point for your zoom. So again, your zoom is always locked to the bottom. This can be great if the majority of what you want to view is located near the bottom, but this isn't always the case. Back at our zoom menu, scroll down and select split zoom and turn it on. With the split zoom, the screen will be divided in half, with one half displaying the traditional sonar and the other side showing the zoomed view. If you look at the non-zoom side, you'll see that the zoom window can be adjusted in size and depth. And as our zoom window is adjusted, we'll notice that our zoomed area on the left of the display screen also changes. My biggest piece of advice when using the zoom feature is don't go overboard. A little bit of zoom actually goes a long way, and if you zoom too much, you may actually have the opposite effect to make things harder to interpret or see. Now I'm gonna show you a feature that I do use quite often, and that's how to pause your sonar screen. This is extremely useful when you wanna pause your sonar screen to get a better look at the targets or structures that you see in the water column. I'm also gonna show you a cool trick on how to mark waypoints from a paused sonar screen. Pausing the sonar is actually very easy. From the traditional sonar view, simply press the left or right arrow on the arrow keypad to pause the current sonar view. Pausing the sonar gives you a chance to interpret the sonar images without the sonar screen moving, which in turn gives you a bit more time to look at and accurately interpret what you're seeing on your screen. Here's another really cool trick when you pause your sonar. You can use the arrow keypad to cursor over any piece of structure you see on your screen. Now simply press the waypoint key, and now you've accurately marked that exact piece of structure on your waypoint map. The next feature we look at can have a huge impact on what you see or don't see on your sonar screen. And that's the gain adjustment. Having a good understanding of your gain adjustments is very important. And that's because gain adjustment can be a double-edged sword. Too much gain may show more detail, However, it may introduce more clutter and noise. Too low of gain, you may get rid of all that noise and clutter, but now you may be missing fish. So adjusting your gain is a little bit of a balancing act based on the water conditions where you fish. From the traditional sonar screen, let's press the menu key. This brings up our menu options for the traditional sonar screen. From here, scroll down and select gain. Here you'll see your current gain setting selection, which in our case is currently set to auto medium. We can also use our arrow keypad to manually select our desired sonar gain from zero to 100. And we can easily set our gain back to an auto selection by simply selecting enable auto gain, which will then allow us to select between auto low, auto medium, and auto high gain. So what's the difference between manually setting your gain or using one of the auto gain selections? Auto gain allows the fish finder to automatically select what it feels is the best gain setting within a desired band, either low, medium, or high. With the auto gain feature, the fish finder constantly will be adjusting the sonar gain within that selected band to show the most detailed returns and least amount of clutter. In general, I find that the Garmin Striker does a great job of adjusting the sonar gain in the auto modes. However, there are specific situations, such as vertical jigging, or for those of us who want to fine-tune our sonar gains, we also have the manual gain option. The manual gain setting will allow you to adjust your sonar gain in increments of 1, from 0 to 100. Manually setting your gain will allow you to fine-tune your sonar for your specific water conditions. And I also find it very useful when vertical jigging. I choose manual gain settings for when I'm vertical jigging, for consistency. And that's because in auto, the fish finder is going to be continually adjusting the gain based on current conditions. And sometimes it might adjust the gain to a point where you lose your jig on your screen. Now I'm going to give you a few tips for adjusting your sonar gain to help you get the best image quality possible. Now what I'm going to show you aren't steadfast rules, but they're a great starting point to help you find the ideal gain settings for your water conditions. <music> I hope this helps shed a little bit of light on how to adjust the gain on your sonar. Our next discussion topic is going to be frequency. The frequency you select is going to impact the angle and overall diameter of your sonar cone. Now if you want to learn more about sonar frequency and sonar cone angles, be sure to check out the supplemental videos that I'll link to down in the description as they go in depth on sonar frequency and cone angles for the Garmin Striker. From the traditional sonar screen, press the menu key to bring up the menu options for the traditional sonar screen. 
Now let's scroll down and select frequency. Here you'll see we have a few options for frequency selection. 77,000 hertz chirp, 200,000 hertz chirp, standard 77,000 hertz, and a standard 200,000 hertz. First I'm going to discuss the difference between the 77 and 200 kHz frequency selections. In the case of the Garmin Striker, the 77 kHz frequency cone angle is about 45 degrees, while the 200 kHz frequency cone angle is roughly 15 degrees. So how does that translate to actual fishing scenarios? Well, one of the most frequently asked questions I get is how much area is my sonar cone covering at any given time? And the answer is directly related to what frequency selection you choose. Now let's look at an example of fishing in 30 feet of water with the 77 kHz frequency selection. At 30 feet, our sonar cone will be covering an area of about 25 feet in diameter. However, since our sonar is a cone, our coverage is actually only about 16.6 .6 feet at 20 feet of water and roughly 8.3 feet and 10 feet of water. Now let's look at how it compares to the 200 kHz frequency selection. At 30 feet of water, our sonar cone will be covering an area of about 8 feet in diameter. However, again, since our sonar is a cone, our coverage is actually only about 5.2 feet and 20 feet of water and our sonar cone only covers about 2.6 feet and 10 feet of water. So how do you know which frequency selection is right for you? The higher frequencies use narrow beam widths, which tend to be better for high speed operation or rough sea conditions. Bottom definition and thermocline definition can also be better when using a higher frequency. Lower frequencies use a wider beam width, which can actually let you see more targets in the water, but it can also generate more surface noise and reduce some bottom signal continuity, especially during rough seas. Wider beam widths also perform better in deep water because the lower frequency has better deep water penetration. Now let's take a look at the chirp frequency selections. The chirp sonar selection differs from single frequency selection in one major way. While single frequency selections saturate the water column with pulses in one frequency band, chirp sonar selections use multiple bands at the same time. The end result is better target separation and clearer sonar images. When using the 77 kHz or 200 kHz chirp frequency selections, our sonar cone angles do not change on the Garmin Striker. The 77 kHz chirp frequency cone angle is still about 45 degrees, while the 200 kHz chirp frequency cone angle is still about 15 degrees. The only difference is that the chirp selections use a band of frequencies versus a single frequency. With the standard transducer, the 77 kHz chirp frequency will cover the 77 kHz frequency band, plus or minus 5 kHz, which means the 77 kHz chirp selection will sweep frequencies between 72 kHz and 82 kHz, while the 200 kHz chirp frequency selection will cover the 200 kHz frequency band, plus or minus about 5 kHz. This means the 200 kHz chirp frequency selection will sweep frequencies from 195 kHz to 205 kHz. As you can see, the chirp sonar frequency selection definitely puts more energy into the water comp, which will help you get better target separation and clearer sonar images. Now, if you really want to up your chirp sonar game and learn more about the Garmin Striker chirp sonar and additional chirp transducer options, be sure to check out my video on chirp sonar that I'll leave a link to down in the description. In today's class, we're going to be looking at the split frequency sonar screen, which is a pretty cool feature that allows you to use two sonar frequencies on a split screen. Now, this class is going to be a little bit shorter than other classes because I won't be going in depth on every single feature of the split frequency sonar view. And that's because the majority of these features have already been covered in previous classes. And those previous classes are going to be linked down below. So you can check them out later to get a better understanding in depth of any of these features that you might find interesting. From the home screen, scroll down and select split frequency. This will bring up our split frequency sonar screen. As you can see, we have two sonar images, one on the left and one on the right. And down in the lower left corner of each sonar screen, you can see we're using two different sonar frequencies. In this case, we're using the Chirp 200 kHz and the Chirp 77 kHz. The rest of the sonar screen should look pretty familiar to you with our numbers overlay and our depth scale. Now let's press the menu key and bring up our menu options for the split frequency sonar screen. Again, these should look pretty familiar from previous classes. We can adjust our range, gain, frequency, zoom, overlay numbers, and sonar setup. Let's start by selecting the range. Now, as I've said in previous classes, the range is usually best left in auto. However, if you do decide to make any range adjustments, it's gonna affect both sides of the sonar screen. Now let's select gain. We can see with our gain settings, we can select our left or right sonar screen to make adjustments to. Let's take a look by selecting the right side and make a gain adjustment. Change our gain should be familiar from previous classes and as you can see, you can select to adjust your gain manually or choose one of the 
free auto settings. Our next menu option will be frequency. From the split frequency sonar menu, scroll down to and select frequency. You can now adjust your frequency selection for your left or right sonar screens. Let's adjust the frequency for the left side sonar screen. You see we have the option for chirp 200 kHz or standard 200 kHz. For the purpose of this demonstration, we're going to select the standard 200 kHz frequency selection. Now when we go back to the split frequency sonar screen, you'll see the left hand screen now indicates standard 200 kHz sonar frequency is selected. Now we'll discuss the zoom option for the split frequency sonar view. From the split frequency sonar menu, scroll down to and select zoom. Here you'll see we have the same options for zoom that we had in our traditional sonar screen. No zoom, bottom lock, manual, or auto. Our next split frequency menu option will be our overlay numbers. From the split frequency sonar menu, scroll down to and select overlay numbers. This is where we can add the navigation insert, compass tape, device voltage, depth, speed, and time of day to our screen. Now as with the traditional sonar options, the compass tape is going to appear on the very top of the screen, while the overlays for voltage, depth, speed, and time will appear on the upper left hand side of the screen. Now we're going to move along to sonar setup for the split frequency sonar view. Now the sonar setup features are pretty much the same as we already went over in class number 4 and 5. But again, the links to all those previous classes are down below for you to explore later. From the split frequency sonar menu, scroll down to and select sonar setup. Here we'll have the option for adding a depth line, adjusting our scroll speed, sonar appearance, noise rejection, and we're restoring our sonar to factory default settings. Let's start by selecting our depth line and turning it on. As you can see, our adjustable depth line is applied to both the left and right sonar screens. Now if we change our scroll speed again, it's going to be set the same for the left and the right sonar screens. Selecting our appearance settings gives us the option to change our sonar color scheme, enable the edge feature to help us determine a hard or soft bottom, the A-scope feature to show us real-time sonar data, or fish symbols. Under the sonar setup, let's look at the noise reject settings. The noise reject menu gives us the options to adjust interference, surface noise, or TVG, time variable gain. Again, all these features for noise rejection were gone over in class number four, so check that video out, which I'll link to down below, if you're interested in learning more about any of these settings and features. In the next few classes, we're going to be covering GPS features such as tracks, routes, and waypoints. And here in class number seven, we're going to start by diving into tracks. However, before we get started, there is one thing I do want to point out. And that's the Garmin Striker models with quick draw contour maps are going to have some additional GPS features as a result of the available quick draw maps. And that's why if you're using the Garmin Striker Fish Finder for more advanced navigation, I'm going to recommend the more advanced Garmin Striker Fish Finders with that available contour mapping as that quick draw contour mapping and those additional features are going to make your navigating experience a whole lot more enjoyable. Now let's get started discussing tracks. The track feature shows you where you've been on the waypoint map. So another way to look at the track feature is that it's a history of where your vessel's been in the past. Let's scroll down and select waypoint map. Here on the waypoint map you can see some tracks from past uses on the fish finder. Let's zoom in a bit and take a better look at the current track. Now we're going to look at some of the menu options for our tracks. Let's press the menu key. Now scroll down and select track. Here we can select track, track options, clear track, or follow track. Let's start by selecting track. Our first option lets you turn your tracks to show or hide. Turning the tracks to hide will hide all your tracks on the waypoint map. Now we're going to look at how to change our track recording mode on our fish finder. Now let's go back to our track menu and select track options. Here we can change our recording mode, recording interval, and our track color. Let's select record mode. The record mode allows you to decide what way you would like your Garmin Striker to record tracks and save them to the fish finder. Our options are off, fill, and wrap. If you turn the record mode to off, the fish finder will show your current track. However, the fish finder will not save your track for reference later when you turn your fish finder back on. Selecting the record mode to fill, the fish finder will record and save tracks until the memory is full. Speaking of the memory being full, this is a good opportunity to remind you that you can view your current track memory usage by pressing the menu key on the waypoint map and selecting track. The memory usage is displayed on the bottom of the screen. Back to our record modes again, we can also select wrap. This will continuously record a track and as the memory fills, the oldest data will automatically be replaced by the newest data. Now let's look at how to adjust the track recording interval. However, there's one thing I want you to keep in mind when adjusting the track interval. If you set your fish finder to record at shorter intervals, it's going to record more points within your track. This is going to make your track more exact. However, when having a shorter record interval and more points recorded for your track, you're also going to use more memory. 
In all honesty, I've had no issues with just leaving my record intervals at the factory default settings. Let's go back to the track option menu. Now scroll down and select record interval. Here we can select our recording intervals, basically how often the fish finder saves a point to build our tracks. Let's select interval. Here you can select our recording interval to be based off of distance, time, or resolution. Distance will record your track based on selected distance. Time will record your track based on a select time. And the resolution will record your track based on a variance setting. Let's select distance. Now you can see our record interval is set to distance. Now let's scroll down and select change. We can now change the distance interval at which the fish finder will record a point to build our track. Again, if you shorten the distance, the fish finder will record more points for a more exact track at the expense of more memory usage. Let's head back to our track options menu and scroll down and select track color. As you can see we have a large assortment of colors to choose from black, dark red, dark green, dark yellow, dark blue, dark magenta, dark cyan, light gray, dark gray, red, green, yellow, blue, magenta, cyan, and white. Now we're going to look at how to clear the track log and all the associated points. From our waypoint map press the menu key. Now scroll down and select track. Now scroll down and select clear track. As you can see, you get a warning message to ensure you want to delete all points in your track log. Select OK to clear all the tracks saved to your fish finder. Now one cool feature that the Garmin Striker Fish Finders has, and I'm sure this is something that a lot of viewers are going to want to learn and understand, is how to select and follow a past track. So let's take a look. From the waypoint map, press the menu key. Now scroll down and select track. Now scroll down and select follow track. As you can see here, we have some past tracks listed for us to choose from. Let's scroll down and select a track. As you can see, we're taken back to the waypoint map. And as we can see, our selected track's been highlighted, and a checkered flag has been added to indicate the end of our track. You can now follow the past track your vessel navigated to ensure a safe return. If you look in the upper portion of the screen, we'll see that we now show overlays for GPS speed, GPS heading, depth, distance to destination, estimated arrival time, and our current bearing. Now all these overlays are adjustable in the menu under overlay numbers, which we've covered in past classes. But this screen look and layout will be very familiar to you in the next classes when we cover routes. Earlier I told you that the Garmin Striker Fish Finder models with the quick draw contour mapping are going to have a few additional features. So let's switch over to the Garmin Striker Vivid 4 and look at some of those additional features. From the main menu let's scroll down and select the quick draw maps. Now let's press the menu key and scroll down and select tracks. Once again we have the option to turn our tracks on or off. Let's scroll down and select track display. Here we can see we have the ability to change our track colors. Now let's go back to our track menu. Let's scroll down and select active track. Here you'll see options for how our tracks are recorded. Again we can change our recording mode, recording interval, and our track color. Back at the track menu, our next option allows you to delete your tracks. Our next feature is where our quick draw contour models differ from the base models with regard to tracks. And it's probably one of my favorite features within the quick draw contour mapping. Let's scroll down to and select follow active track. Now we're given the option of which track we'd like to follow. So let's select a track. And once a track is selected, you'll be taken to the waypoint map where our track will be highlighted and a checkered flag will be added for our endpoint. Now let's talk about the ability to save tracks within the quick draw contour mapping. Let's scroll down and select Save Active Track. This will bring up a list of our active tracks. Now let's select our active track. Now we have the option to edit our track, delete our track, or follow our track. Let's select Edit Track. We now have the ability to change the name of our track, the color of our track, or save the track as a route, which is a great time saver and an invaluable tool in my opinion. Let's scroll down and select Save as Route. Now we will see our map has been populated with markers for each turn within our newly saved route. Let's go back to the track menu and scroll down and select Save Tracks. Here we'll see a list of all of our saved tracks. Now let's select the saved track. We'll have the option to edit the track, delete the track, or follow the track. Let's select Follow Track. We now have the option to either follow our track forward or backwards depending on our needs and starting location and destination. Once we select forward or backwards again we'll be taken back to our map and the track will be highlighted with a checkered flag to indicate the track endpoint. So here we are at class number 8, where we're going to be going over the route features of the Garmin Striker Fish Finder. In this video, we're going to be looking at how to mark and edit routes on the Garmin Striker Fish Finder, and I'll be showing you in depth how to use the route feature on the Garmin Striker 4 and the Striker 4 Vivid with quick draw contours. Starting at the home screen, let's scroll down and select Waypoint Map. From the Waypoint Map, press the menu key. Now scroll down and select Routes. Now we want to create a new route, so select New. 
Now we have two options for creating our new route. We can create a route using the waypoint map or create a route using the waypoint list. Let's start by scrolling down and selecting to create our new route with the waypoint list. You can see our screen now shows our saved waypoints. We'll be selecting our waypoints in the order we wish to create this new route. Let's scroll down and select brush one as our first waypoint in the route. Now I wanna point out that as you select the waypoint for your route, a route icon appears. Now scroll down and select marker 47 and notice the route icon appears again. Now let's scroll up and select bait for our final waypoint on this route. Once we have our waypoint selected for our route, press the back key. We'll now see a list of our route turns in order. Pressing the back key again will take us back to the waypoint map with our newly created route highlighted. Here we'll have the option to edit the route, which we'll be discussing a bit later, or navigate to. Let's scroll down and select navigate to. Here we can decide how we wish to navigate our route, forward, backwards, or offset. Let's scroll down and select offset. Using the offset feature, your route navigation will help keep your vessel a set distance from the actual route that's marked. Let's look at the displayed images for more clarification. As you can see, based on your selection, the vessel route will offset from the actual marked route. Now with that out of the way, let's press the back key and scroll up and select forward. We're now taken back to the waypoint map where our route will be highlighted and additional navigational information will be displayed at the top of the screen. As a reminder, the displayed navigational information can be changed in the menu settings and overlays. Now let's look at how to stop our route navigation. Simply press the menu key at any time and select stop navigation. This will end our route navigation and bring back up the waypoint map. Now let's look at a second way how to set up and save a route. And this is probably the one that I use the most. Let's start from the waypoint map. And as you can see, we have a previously used track. Now we're gonna set our new route based on points off this track. From our waypoint map, press the menu key. Now scroll down and select routes. Let's select new. Now let's select route using waypoint map. We're now taken back to the waypoint map where we'll be able to select points for our new route. Simply use the arrow keypad to move the cursor to our first point on our new route and press enter. Our first point or our beginning point is now saved. We will now move our cursor to the desired second point for our new route. Notice as you move the cursor for your second point, there's a line to help you visualize your route leg before saving the second point. Once you've determined the placement of the second point in the route, press enter. Our route is now highlighted. We can now use the arrow keypad to move the cursor to continue to set up more points for our route. And once our route's complete, press the menu key. We're now given the option to edit our route or navigate to. Let's scroll down to and select navigate to. Now let's select forward. We're now taken back to the waypoint map where our new route will be highlighted and the additional navigational information will be displayed at the top of the screen. Now we're gonna take a look at how to edit our currently saved routes. Let's start at the waypoint map. Press the menu key. Now scroll down to and select routes. Here you'll see our two newly formed routes. Let's select our last route that we made from a track on the waypoint map. Once selected, we're given the option to edit our route or navigate to. This time we're going to select edit route. Now we're able to edit our route name, delete our route, or edit turns within our route. Selecting name will allow us to change the route name and make it easier to recognize. Once complete with selecting a new name, press the enter key to save the new name. Our next option is delete. Selecting delete will allow us to delete our route. Let's scroll down and select edit turns. We're now given the choice to edit our turns using the waypoint map or use the turn list. Let's select use waypoint map. We're now taken to the waypoint map and our route will be highlighted. Use the arrow keypad to move the cursor over the point you wish to change along the route and press enter. You can now edit that point along the route or edit that turn. Let's scroll down to and select edit turn. We can now move the turn or delete the turn. Let's select move turn. We're brought back to the waypoint map and we can use the arrow keypad to move the cursor to our new point for the route. Again, notice that thin line to help you visualize your new route addition. Once you decide on the location of the new point for your route, Press the enter key. Our newly edited route is now highlighted and ready for navigation. Now I want to switch over and take a little bit of time to look at routes on the Garmin Striker Vivid. Now I don't want to spoil it, but there's really only one major difference between the Garmin Striker 4 Vivid with quick draw contours and the standard Garmin Striker Fish Finders. We're going to start from the home screen and scroll down and select quick draw maps. Now press the menu key. Let's scroll down to and select routes. As you can see, just like on the base Striker 4, we can select new route. And then we're given two familiar options, route using chart or route using waypoint list. I won't be going into any further detail here on creating new routes with the Vivid because it's exactly the same as with the base model that we just covered. Now let's take a look at where these two units differ. And in my opinion, it's a great time saver depending on how you like to make your routes. Let's start on the waypoint map and press the menu key. Now I want to scroll down and select tracks. Yes, I said select tracks. Scroll down to and select save tracks. Now let's select our save track. 
We're now taken to the map with our save track and a few options. Let's select edit track and you'll see at the bottom of the option list, save as route. So let's scroll down to and select save as a route. Our track is now saved as a route and we have the option to edit or navigate with our new route. If we select edit, we'll see the same options that were available with the Base Striker 4. And if we scroll down to and select Navigate 2, again, we'll have the same navigation options as we did with the Base Model Striker 4. So here we are, class number 9. We're going to be going over waypoints on the Garmin Striker Fish Finder. In this video, we're going to show you three ways to mark waypoints. Using GPS coordinates, the waypoint map, and how to mark a waypoint at your current position. We're also going to show you how to edit your waypoints and some options for managing your list of waypoints. First up, we're going to take a look at how to mark waypoints using known GPS coordinates. Let's start this class at the waypoint map. Now press the menu key. Select waypoints. Now select new waypoint. Here we're presented with three options for marking our new waypoint. Either enter the coordinates, use the waypoint map, or use our current position. Let's select enter coordinates. Now we can enter the longitude and latitude of our desired waypoint. Simply use the arrow keypad to enter your desired coordinates. Here's a helpful hint, the GPS coordinates listed initially on the screen are actually your current position. Once you have your desired coordinates entered, press the enter key to save. We're now taken to a screen where we can edit our newly created waypoint. Here we can change the name of our waypoint, add a symbol to represent our waypoint, enter a depth, water temperature, or add a comment to our created waypoint. Let's rename our waypoint, so let's select name. In our case, we're going to rename this waypoint WP1 for waypoint 1. Once complete, press enter to save. Now scroll down and select symbol. Here we're going to select a symbol that represents this new waypoint. In our case, this new waypoint will represent a marina where we launched our vessel. So we're going to select the marina symbol. Now if we know or want to, we can enter the water depth at our waypoint along with the water temperature. Now let's scroll down and select comment. For our example here, we're going to enter our marina's actual name for the comment section. Our marina is HP Marina, and once entered, press the enter key to save. Now let's press the back button until we're brought back to the waypoint map. And here we can see our newly created waypoint, WP1, representing our marina where we launched at. Now we're going to look at how to mark a waypoint using the waypoint map. Now, this method of marking a waypoint isn't particularly useful, especially on the base model Garmin Striker fish finders, because you have no contour mapping available. However, it's a great choice if you have one of the more advanced Garmin Striker fish finders, such as the Vivid or the Plus, as you'll have quick draw mapping, and you'll be able to mark waypoints at different contours. Again, we'll start at the waypoint map. Now press the menu key, select waypoints, now select new waypoint. This time, let's select and use waypoint map. We're taken to the waypoint map where we can use the arrow keypad to move our cursor to the location of our desired waypoint. Once we've determined the location of our new waypoint, press the enter key to save. Now let's press the back key and you'll see our newly created waypoint listed. Let's scroll down and select our newest waypoint. We can now select edit waypoint to edit our waypoint information. Again, we can edit our waypoint's name, symbol, input a water depth, water temperature, or leave a comment. Let's select name. And in this example, we're going to name our new waypoint B1 for brush pile 1. Once our new name is entered, press the enter key. Now let's scroll down and select the symbol. Since waypoint B1 is a brush pile, let's scroll down and select the symbol for a brush pile. Now we can also enter a water depth for our waypoint and a water temperature, along with being able to enter a comment if desired. Now let's press the back key until we return to the waypoint map. And here you'll see our newly created waypoint B1. Now we're going to look at how to mark a waypoint using our current position. In my opinion, this will be the primary way that most of our waypoints get marked. One thing to note is you can mark a waypoint at your current position from any screen on the Garmin Striker Fish Finder. The waypoint map, the traditional sonar screen, or any saved combo screens. Starting on the waypoint map, let's press the waypoint key on the Fish Finder's keypad. This will immediately create a waypoint in our exact location and allow you to begin editing that waypoint. Let's select Edit Waypoint to edit our waypoint's information. Again, we can edit our waypoint's name, symbol, input a water depth, water temperature, or leave a comment. One thing to note is that since we created this waypoint at our exact current location, the water depth and temperature will automatically be entered for you. Let's select Name. And in this example, we're going to name our new waypoint B2 for Brush Pile 2. Once our name is entered, press the Enter key to save. Now let's scroll down and select Symbol. Waypoint B2 is a brush pile, so let's scroll down and select the symbol for a brush pile. 
Scrolling down, we see our water depth and temperature are already entered for us. We can also leave a comment for our waypoint if desired. Now let's press the back key until we return to the waypoint map. And here you'll see our newly created waypoint, B2. Now we're going to touch on how to edit our waypoints. Starting on the waypoint maps, press the menu key. Now select waypoints. Now we will scroll down and select the waypoint we wish to edit. In our case, it'll be WP1. Here you'll see all the information that's saved regarding WP1. And you'll see that there are three pages of information available. On page one, we can see our waypoint name and coordinates along with our current distance from the waypoint, bearing, and direction. We can use the arrow keypad to scroll through these pages. Page two shows the date and time our waypoint was last modified or created. And on page three, it'll show our waypoint on the waypoint map. Now let's go back to page one and select edit waypoint. We can now edit our waypoint's name, symbol, depth, water temperature, or add a comment. Let's select name. Now let's change our waypoint's name to M1 and press enter to save. Our waypoint's name has now been successfully changed to M1. Now we're going to show you an example of a real life situation that you're most likely to encounter when marking a waypoint. Here we are on the traditional sonar screen and we can see what appears to be some type of submerged structure. And we're going to want to mark that structure with a waypoint so we can come back later and fish it. To do this, when we see the image of the structure, we're going to press the waypoint key in the lower right hand corner of the fish finder keypad. When we do this, a new waypoint at that exact location will be created and we'll be able to edit our new waypoint's parameters. This will be the primary way that most of your waypoints are probably going to be created. And this method will work on the traditional sonar screen, waypoint map, or any of the combo screens. Simply press the waypoint key and create a waypoint at your exact location. Now we're going to take a look at some options for managing and organizing your waypoints. Let's start at the home screen. Scroll down and select user data. Select waypoints. Now you'll see a list of all your available waypoints that are saved to the fish finder. This is where you'll press the menu key. Now you'll have some options for sorting your waypoints. You can sort by name, sort by distance, sort by symbol, filter by symbol, or search. Let's select sort by name. As you can see now all our waypoints are sorted in alphabetical order. Now let's go back and select sort by distance. Now all our waypoints are sorted by their distance from our current location. Now let's go back and sort by symbol. As you can see all of our waypoints are now grouped by their chosen symbol. Now go back and select filter by symbol. This is a very useful sort option especially if you're looking only to deal with certain waypoints such as brush piles. So let's scroll down and select brush pile. Now our screen will only show waypoints that have the brush pile selected for their symbol. Going back and selecting search will allow you to key in a name or partial name and search through your saved waypoints. For this example, let's just put in B and search our waypoints starting with B. And when we press the enter key, we'll see all of our waypoints that start with the letter B displayed on our screen. So here we are, class number 10, we're going to be going over the flasher feature of the Garmin Striker Fish Finder. Now the flasher is an old school feature that has a ton of relevance today, especially for those who know how to tap into its strengths. In this video, we're going to look at the adjustable menu options for the flasher, and then we're going to look at real examples from the flasher to help us understand and read the screen. From the home screen, select flasher. Now we'll look at some of our menu options for the flasher. So press the menu key. You'll see we have some options that should look familiar from earlier classes in the series. Range, gain, frequency, overlay number, and sonar setup. Let's select range. Here you can select the depth range for your sonar screen. For me, if I'm moving while fishing, like from a boat or a kayak, I tend to leave my range in auto. However, if you're stationary, such as ice fishing, you may want to set it just over the max depth of the hole you're fishing. Now let's go back, scroll down, and select gain. Again, we went over the gain in depth in class number 5, which is linked down below in the description, so I won't spend a lot of time with details here. Let's go back, scroll down, and select frequency. With the flasher, you have the use of the standard 77 or 200 kHz frequencies, along with the option to choose the 77 or 200 kHz chirp frequencies. I tend to like the chirp 77 kHz for the majority of my fishing, including ice fishing. However, depending on water depth and your application, the 200 kHz option can be very useful. Now let's go back and now we'll select overlay numbers. Here you can adjust and turn on or off some of your optional number overlays. Number overlays were talked about in depth in class number four. 
For the flasher, the most useful overlay to adjust will be editing our layout. So scroll down and select Edit Layout. Here you can adjust your readouts on the top of your flasher screen. For me, when using the flasher, I like to keep it simple with water depth, water temperature, and device voltage, as these are what's most important to me. Now let's go back and scroll down and select Sonar Setup. Here's where you can make adjustments to various aspects of your flasher sonar. Let's start with scroll speed. Generally, I like to keep scroll speed around slow or medium. However, for vertical jigging or ice fishing, Garmin actually recommends the use of ultra scroll, which is the fastest setting. And if you're interested in seeing more on the scroll settings, be sure to check out class number four, which I've also linked to down in the description for an in-depth discussion. Let's go back, scroll down, and select appearance. This is where you can change the sonar color scheme. Let's select yellow as a demonstration. Now, for me personally, when using the flasher, I actually prefer the classic blue as it has better color separation in my opinion. Now, let's go back, scroll down, and select noise reject. Here you can adjust your noise rejection settings such as interference, surface noise, and TVG. Again, all these settings were covered in depth in class number four. Now it's time to look at a few examples and learn the basics of how to read the flasher. Let's start with the fundamentals. The flasher circle is meant to represent the entire water column, from the surface to the bottom. And the best part about the flasher is you're actually seeing the water column within the transducer cone in real time. Here, starting at zero, we're at the surface. And as we move around clockwise, we see the larger blue area. This is the water column. And as we continue clockwise, we'll see a large red area here. This is the bottom at around 30 feet. The actual bottom depth is displayed at the center of the flasher screen. And if you look, there's depth markers for reference that'll be shown around the inner flasher circle. Here we can see that our water depth is about 35 feet. And looking into the water column, we can see what likely is a fish about 15 feet. Now let's look at another example. In this next example, we see fish at what appears to be about 8 feet and 30 feet. Now that we have a basic understanding of the flasher screen, let's take a look at an example in motion. In this next clip, we're going to see our bait, and then a fish will appear in our sonar cone near our bait. Now we're going to see a really cool scene unfold. We're going to see our bait. Then we're going to see a fish attack our bait. Then you're going to see a solid hookup in fighting that fish. For this class, I'm going to be showing you how to set up your fish finder for simulation mode. But, more importantly, what features and functions can benefit you the most while in simulation mode? Let's start this class at the home screen. Now let's scroll down and select Settings. Now select System and scroll down to and select Simulator. Here we're going to have our simulator options like Off, On, or Setup. Let's scroll down to and select Setup. Select OK. In Setup, we can now define our track control speed, or set our starting position if we wish. In all honesty, I don't go through the trouble of setting up these parameters in simulator mode because in my opinion the GPS features and such are not functions that the simulator mode really provides a lot of add value with. With that said, let's press the back key and return to the system menu. And we can see our simulator is now on. Now we're going to go through various features and functions. And I'll show you what features work well in the simulator mode, as well as the features that don't. Now I won't be going in depth on any of these features, since all the menus and features of the Garmin Striker Fish Finder have been covered in depth in previous classes that are linked to down in the description. Now, there's one thing I do want to cover before we get started. And that's that any menu features or options that you change while in simulation mode will be saved to the fish finder. So if you change your color, for instance, say from blue to yellow in simulator mode, when you turn your fish finder on again, the color scheme for your sonar is still going to be yellow. So be sure to take that into account while using simulator mode. Let's start again at the home screen and select a traditional sonar. Now. Press the menu key. Here we'll have our sonar menu options. Range, 
You can adjust the range and learn how to use this feature while in simulator mode. However, like I've said in previous videos in general, I just tend to leave the range in auto. Gain. Adjusting the gain in simulator mode has no effect on the simulation that's being replayed. So it's best just to make your gain adjustments while on the water, which in all honesty is the best place for these adjustments anyway. Frequency. Adjusting the frequency in simulator mode will have no effect on the simulation that's playing, other than showing the selected frequency in the bottom corner of the sonar screen. Zoom. Here's a great feature that you can learn to use and master in the simulation mode. It's a good place to learn how to use the various zoom options and see which ones may or may not work for you. Overlay numbers. Within the simulation mode, you can adjust your overlay numbers and see how those changes affect your sonar screen. This gives you a chance to set the overlays you want to use and turn off the overlays and features you don't. Now let's select the sonar setup menu. Depth line. The depth line functions great in simulation mode. Turn it on and off and see what you prefer and if you'd rather use it or not. Scroll speed. The scroll speed's fully adjustable in simulation mode, so give it a try, test out each scroll speed, and see what you prefer. Color scheme. While in simulation mode, you have a great opportunity to go through all the various color schemes available on the Garmin Striker and see which color choice is your favorite. Edge feature. Turn the edge feature on and see and learn how it works to help you interpret hard or soft bottoms where you're fishing. A scope. Works great in simulator mode and is extremely helpful in helping you learn how to interpret and understand your sonar better. Fish symbols. Turn your fish symbols on or off and see what you may prefer all while in simulation mode. Now let's go back to the sonar setup menu. Noise reject. This is another setting that doesn't function in the simulator mode to any of the changes that you make. And honestly, it's another one of the settings that's best to be adjusted while on the water. Now we're gonna look at some of our GPS functions and if they're useful in simulator mode. In my opinion, simulator mode, while functional for some GPS features, in general, I find it not that helpful. And honestly, sometimes downright frustrating to try and use. And I think that's due to the fact that the GPS and mapping functions are kind of standalone in the unit itself. And that's why the GPS will function anywhere without having to run the simulation mode. Let's start on the home screen and select waypoint map. Now, press the menu key. Waypoints, waypoint display, routes, tracks, search, zoom, map setup, and overlay numbers. All can be accessed while in simulation mode. However, it's not required and they can be accessed just as easy without entering simulation mode. As you can see, the simulator mode can be very useful in helping you learn and set up your Garmin Striker Fish Finder. However, you have to be realistic in your expectations and what you're trying to accomplish. As you can see, simulator mode has the most functionality within our sonar, where you can use it to see changes to an actual underwater simulation. And though many features do work well in simulator mode, there are a few that don't. If you made it this far, congratulations, and give yourself a great big pat on the back for taking the time to learn how to use your Striker Fish Finder. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to comment down below. And I hope you've already hit that subscribe button. Good luck and thank you, and we'll see you next time on the water.